All right, everybody, welcome back. It is uh, currently April 2020, um, and you know what is going on in the world right now. So first, before we start out with anything, I do want to extend my best wishes for you and yours during this hard time, and uh, I just want to offer a little bit of encouragement in that we are going to get through this, and uh, that I'm happy that you can join me here while we work on a hobby that is... Uh, just very creative and uh, I think that's really important to keep your mind engaged and active during this time especially if you're stuck at home uh, so please grab uh, a beer from your local craft brewery support them the best you can during this time and uh, watch on the next series of videos that I'm doing including this one are going to be kind of oriented towards uh, doing more with less uh, so I'm imagining many of us are in a situation right now that I'm in where the local homebrew shop is closed and uh, we don't really have the ability to go out and get ingredients whenever we want to to brew some of these more extravagant beers. Uh, Northern Brewer is still open by the way so for those of you who get your ingredients online as far as right now April 5th 2020 it's still open um, so I have ordered a bunch of stuff from them and it got here yesterday so we are going to be brewing a couple beers with simple ingredient lists over the next several uh, weeks. So in this video I'm going to show you a technique on how to unlock the starches and sugars contained in some of your local household ingredients and possibly stuff you might get from your grocery store that might help out with some of these brews as well. Today what we're doing is a cream ale. This, like the California Common, is one of the only styles of beer out there that actually originated in the United States. Um, it's a pre-prohibition style of beer and it's essentially an ale version of an American lager. Not a light lager, this definitely has a lot more flavor than a light lager. It's basically the same exact grain bill um, with uh, ale yeast instead. So if you're one of those folks out there that really likes the American Pale Lagers and you don't have the ability to do your own lagering, uh, which is, you know, tough to do sometimes without temperature control, consider this version of beer uh, to possibly make if you want to have that same exact clean pale lager profile because you can do the same exact stuff with a cream ale. So within American styles, there's a couple pale, uh, easy drinking, light styles. Uh, there's a cream ale and there's a blonde ale. So there's uh, often a lot of overlap between these two styles. Cream ales generally are gonna finish drier. They're gonna attenuate more. Uh, they're also gonna be a lot crisper and lager, more lager-like than a blonde ale. Um, and they're gonna be a little less sweet, a little less full body, less malty, etc. cetera, uh, than a blonde ale would. Blonde ales also don't necessarily need to emulate lagers in what they're doing, so you can have a lot more freedom of expression with a blonde ale, I think. Uh, cream ales can, however, kick off a lot of fruit if you want them to. You can make, I, I know people have done orange creamsicle ales <laughs> in the style of a cream ale. And usually what sets them apart is that they've almost always got some sort of corn-based ingredient, so either like flaked corn or cornmeal or ground maize. Um, or something like to that effect, and then I've also got a decent amount of sugar, just plain old sugar in them, uh, in order to get that dryness that we we're talking about. So that being said, there's a lot of stuff you can do with either style uh, to make yourself a nice pale American ale, uh, without necessarily being hoppy enough to be considered an American pale ale. Uh, God, I love the world of beer styles. All right, so here's our recipe. Uh, this again goes back to the. Uh, whole theme of this thing being extremely simple. Um, it is effectively a single malt, a single hop beer. However, there are a couple unmalted uh, adjuncts that I'm adding in, so it doesn't quite fit that bill. So we're starting out with eight and a half pounds of American Pilsner malt, which is literally the only grain in this entire thing. We're adding half a pound of cornmeal. However, I will do a cereal mash in order to convert the sugars in the cornmeal and make sure that we actually can use what it has to offer. And then one pound of table sugar will be added towards the end of the boil in order to bump our ABV up to the 5.2, hopefully, range. Uh, and then bring our attenuation, hopefully, all the way down to like 1.005 for the final gravity. Uh, for hops, I'm literally using just a single ounce of Galena over the entire brew. Galena is an American high alpha hop varietal, uh, which is one of those quintessential American hops. Uh, we're going to add just under half an ounce, so 0.4 ounces at 60 minutes to bitter. We're going to add another 0.4 ounces at 10 minutes. And then since I have only uh, 0.2 ounces of it left, I mean, I'm just going to chuck it in at zero minutes and see what happens. I don't really care if it has a little bit extra hop nose on it, but uh, it's not going to be overly bitter, and that's really what we want to avoid. 
Uh, so putting it in late isn't going to be that big of a deal, especially with that small of an amount. So for all of my brews during this time period, I'm going to be using uh, recycled washed yeast from some of my old brews. And I typically have top cropped yeast uh, from an active fermentation and stored it in a sterile container in my fridge. Uh, nearly every brew that I've done with a unique yeast variety um, over the last several months. So now I have a good supply of yeast that I can reuse and uh, basically just make a starter with whenever I want to brew. Um, however, in this case, I'm using a type of yeast called Kvike, or I think it might be pronounced Quack. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there's a lot of different pronunciations to it. Um, but it's basically a Norwegian variety of just super yeast. Um, this stuff can ferment in three days completely. Uh, it will ferment happily at 60 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It will not kick off any sort of fusel alcohols and can be pitched in a very small amount. Um, it's it's kind of weird, but it's awesome. And uh, it tends to throw off pretty fruity flavors if you're fermented high, uh, but if you use it actually in higher concentrations and or ferment it slightly lower in your standard ale temperature range, uh, it will actually produce very clean tasting beers. Uh, and almost has a lager-like quality to it when you use it correctly. So what I'm doing is using that particular uh, aspect of the yeast today. I'm going to pitch a large amount of it, and I'm going to ferment it at a standard ale temperature. And it should, hopefully, uh, end up with a very clean-tasting beer. And uh, the best part about this, too, is that you don't need a starter for it. You can just pitch a tablespoon's worth of the actual yeast into the, uh, into the fermenter, and it'll ferment... Uh, properly. It will not be under pitched. For water, uh, keep in mind I'm using my own city's water profile so uh, my ion counts may be a little high compared to what some people have. For calcium I have 25 parts per million, 9 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 65 parts per million of sulfate, um, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 36 parts per million of carbonate. Um, if you are you know, working with your own water profile, I would recommend not just copying mine. I'm just showing you right here what I have uh, for reference later. And um, the thing that I recommend you pay attention to is that basically there's almost twice as much chloride as there is sulfate. Um, this is going to help bring out the malty parts of the beer uh, versus the hoppy parts. I'm going to be adding three grams of gypsum and two grams of Epsom to my mash and sparge water to make sure that it's uh, treated for this water profile. Uh, again, don't copy that exactly because your water is probably going to be different, so make your own calculations. So for mash, I'm going to be doing a single infusion rest at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. Uh, 150 is a temperature that's going to encourage a very uh, fermentable wort, uh, which is going to bring us down to that very low final gravity that we're targeting, uh, hopefully, and uh, a very light-bodied beer at the end of the process. However, in addition to this main mash, I'm going to be doing a cereal mash on the side. And the cereal mash is what you use to uh, to get those uh, kind of different household ingredients or non-malted uh, adjuncts uh, to get the uh, actual starches to convert within them and extract the sugars from them so you can use them in a wort. So you can use unmalted oats, unmalted wheat, unmalted barley, unmalted corn, rice. So pretty much any object that contains a starch can actually have its sugars extracted uh, and used in the brewing process if you are creative enough. But, but a cereal mash is one of those ways that helps uh, get those unmalted grains uh, to give up their sugars for the purpose of using in a mash. And I'll explain the process for that in a minute here. It's actually really simple. Uh, surprised me how easy it was because it was the first time I've actually done one of these. So uh, I'm going to be heating up my mash water pretty soon. Uh, I treated all the water for that profile that I mentioned earlier and uh, also I have added a Camden tablet to the whole thing. So that is basically going to remove chlorine compounds and chloramine compounds from the uh, city water supply which can introduce flavors to a beer that will pretty much ruin it. So it's always a good idea to toss that in if you're using city water. All right, so it's uh, getting time to start the cereal mash now. So what's actually going on is I'm heating up all of my mash and sparge water right now. Uh, and that's still kind of going, but the cereal mash is going to take a minute. So uh, we're going to do that now. We're going to start that up. And then by the time the cereal mash is finished, it'll be ready to dough into the rest of the main mash. It's a real simple process, though. So what I've done here is actually weighed out a whole half pound of cornmeal. 
Uh, and by the way, I used a stone ground cornmeal, which is a little coarser than your standard store-bought cornmeal. If you can look for that stuff, uh, it's gonna give you better results. You can also use grits, by the way, uh, to achieve the same results. I didn't mention that during the recipe section. So I have that half pound of cornmeal here, and then I've also, on top of that, added some crushed malted barley. Uh, this is some Pilsner malt. This is about uh, two ounces of that, which is about 25% of the total weight of cornmeal, which is eight ounces. Uh, so you really wanna keep a 20% ratio of malted barley to whatever starch you're using in the cereal mash. It's gonna help use the enzymes in that barley to convert the rest of the sugars in this mash. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is add this directly in. Uh, so this is actually not on heat, so I'm just gonna put this in this little pot right here. Uh, so that gives you surface to work with. Um, yeah, I just stir it up a little bit there. So what we're gonna do now is actually take some of the water from my mash tun that's been heating, uh, and we're gonna add that into the cereal mash. Not a lot, you know, just a little bit uh, at a time. We're gonna get that all stirred up. And you're essentially doughing in with whatever grain you're trying to work with here. All right, so once that's all distributed, we're just gonna stick a thermometer in here and we're gonna turn on kind of a medium heat uh, and attempt to get this thing up to sacrification temperature range which is gonna depend on what kind of grain you're using. So with corn, uh, which is also known as maize in some uh, cases, the sacrification temperature we're shooting for is actually 158 degrees. So we're gonna let this sit here for a little while and uh, heat itself up to that temperature range. Okay, so as you can see, the uh, uh, temperature of the cereal mash has reached about 160. Um, it's falling back down to 158. I overshot it just a little bit. Uh, it's easier to actually add the appropriate temperature of water to the mash and then stir it up to let it hit the sack rest, just like you would for a normal mash. Um, but I was kind of rushing, which is why we're at where we are. But either way, we've hit the rest point now, so I'm actually just gonna cover this up and let it sit for about 15 minutes at this temperature. All right, we're gonna get ready to mash in now. Uh, since I had my malts ordered in bulk um, and not actually weighed out beforehand, I had to weigh it out myself this time. Uh, which is different, so uh, I'm gonna be adding it from a bowl instead of from the bag. Uh, so just a slight change of process there. So I have this recirculating system that I built, um, which is what I've been taking out and putting back into the pot. Uh, it's not really necessary to help make you good beer. You know, it's just something that makes my process a bit easier because then you have this constant Vorloff. It helps out with work clarity and stuff like that. Uh, if you're doing an igloo cooler mash or a brew in the bag style thing, it's totally fine. Uh, you'll be making good beer just the same way. So we're gonna let this mash sit here for 60 minutes, but first, uh, we got another step on the cereal mash to attend to, so let's get to that. All right, so the cereal mash has completed its uh, mashing step, I guess. Uh, it's been sitting at 158 for about 15 minutes. Uh, so now what we're actually gonna do is slowly raise it up to boiling temperatures, which is gonna help gelatinize the starch. So we're gonna actually sit it, uh, we're gonna kind of do it as if we were doing a decoction mash. You wanna kind of constantly stir it uh, during the heating process, make sure it doesn't scorch. Uh, but you wanna bring it up to boiling and hold it for about 30 minutes at boiling to fully gelatinize all of that starch. And then at that point, all we do is add it back into the main mash. Okay, so it has now been about half an hour and uh, the cereal mash is done. I boiled it uh, and it's now really like gelatinized and gummy and gooey, kind of like an oatmeal type consistency, which makes sense because you're basically doing the same thing as you would if you were cooking oatmeal, except I'm using cornmeal. So now anyway, we're just gonna go ahead and chuck this right into the mash uh, and it's gonna get distributed and recirculated through the whole thing. Um, it is gonna raise the temperature of the mash just a little bit. So if you don't have a recirculating system, you can cool it down beforehand or you can just uh, add some cold water or something or you know, you can always do a little more advanced mash step to, uh, you know, to bring it in at the beginning of your mash if you wish. But right now, I'm just gonna make sure we get all of that starch off of the pot too. Um, 
and now it goes into the mash where it can be converted by enzymes in the mash into sugars. So at this point, we'll wait for another 30 minutes and then we'll finish our mash and uh, get ready to start the boil. And also here is our pH measurement. Um, I do use strips right now, kind of just gets me in the right ballpark. Uh, it looks like it's about right, just, a, just over five, just under 5.5. Uh, ideally you want it to be 5.2. All right, so now the mash has been completed and uh, we're gonna start collecting all the wort we have. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is pump all the liquid from this mash tun into this kettle here. That'll be our first runnings. And then I'm gonna use some 170 degree sparge water I've got going over here on the side. We'll rinse off the grain with that. We'll let it sit for another 15 minutes or so. And then we'll pump whatever comes out of that into this kettle again for our second runnings. Uh, and then we'll pump that all back into the main uh, kettle here, which is gonna become the boil kettle once I remove this bag and all the hardware. All right, so here's our pre-boil gravity measurement. Uh, it's about 8.4 bricks on the refractometer, which translates to about 1033 specific gravity, uh, which is great. It's a little higher than actually we were aiming for, uh, but that's all right. All right, so as you can see, the boil has officially begun. So we're gonna start by adding our first hop addition for 60 minutes. That's the 0.4 ounces of Galena hops. And they're going in right now. And that is the only thing we're adding for uh, most of the boil. Okay, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. So we're gonna add our 10 minute hop addition here, which is another 0.4 ounces of Galena. And then I'm also gonna add this, which is a crumbled up mixture of a Whirlflock tablet, as well as some yeast nutrient, which is always a good thing to add to your beers, no matter how robust the yeast. And last, but certainly not least, we have this one pound of sugar that we gotta add right now. So this is gonna go in gradually, and it's important to stir that in very gradually, otherwise you're gonna end up with some scorching issues, which is not something you really want. So just a little bit at a time to let it dissolve uh, without becoming a giant lump of caramel at the bottom. All right, so the other thing I'm gonna do at 10 minutes is set this up. This is my plate chiller. Um, ideally, you wanna run uh, boiling wort through this for about 10 minutes or so, just to guarantee that the inside is sanitized, all the germs have been killed off, assuming, of course, that it's clean when you start. All right, so we had another 10 minutes since we uh, put those last ingredients in. So I'm gonna go ahead and kill the boil now. So shutting off all my heat sources. And then I'm gonna start chilling. Now, what we do is, I don't know if it's gonna show up on screen or not, but there is a, um, a dial thermometer that is hooked up to the output of the plate chiller. And that is rapidly going down to, uh, well, chilling temperatures. Um, it's gonna hover around 60 to 80 degrees, somewhere in that range for a while, until we dial in the flow rate going through the chiller. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about yeast and fermentation really quickly. This right here is a uh, sanitary container that's contained uh, a lot of Hornendel Kvike yeast that I harvested off of my last brew with the Kvike a couple months ago. It's been sitting in my fridge ever since, and it smells fine, so there is no issue here. So basically all we're gonna do to pitch this is take a sanitized spoon and scoop off this healthy yeast here at the bottom, which is the white colored stuff, and uh, chuck that right into the, uh, the beer. It should be fine the way it is. 
Um, and then of course, what I can do during this brew is actually get rid of whatever's left over and top crop another generation of healthy, fresh yeast, just to be sure that it's young and you know viable. So uh, this stuff, however, is just absolutely bulletproof. It's also pretty awesome that it will ferment um, at nearly any temperature range. So now I'm choosing to ferment this around the standard ale uh, temperature range, which is 65 to 68 Fahrenheit. Um, however, this yeast, as I said at the beginning of the video, can handle temperatures from 60 all the way up to even 100 degrees Fahrenheit without having problems. Uh, it's a very fast fermenter, it's a clean fermenter, and it's an aggressive fermenter. So it will do its job very well and very quickly. I could just let this thing only go down to 80 or 100 degrees and still pitch it. Uh, but I'm still going to choose to brew this as if it was any other normal ale. And I'm looking for that targeted clean profile that a Kvike yeast can deliver uh, when treated like any other yeast. All right, so the uh, temperature of the output is down to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is plenty cold. So we're going to go ahead and transfer over to the fermenter now. Now typically I'm going to aerate by uh, just splashing the wort aggressively into the fermenter. Um, it's just about the best way to do it if you don't have an oxygen wand uh, and you don't want to shake the fermenter aggressively. Um, but you really just, you know, you want to give it a decent amount of um, oxygen here. Now as far as fermentation goes, it should be done within a week. All right, so here's the fun part. Uh, here is the actual jar of yeast, and we're gonna take this sanitized stainless spoon and uh, do our best to get in there and get a good chunk, uh, about a teaspoon's worth, or about a full spoon's worth of, of uh, yeast there, and uh, do it without uh, messing anything up or getting anything in this jar. So we do this very carefully. In fact, I'm actually gonna go ahead and straight up sanitize the lid again. There it is. And in she goes. That's all you have to pitch. Okay, so here is our original gravity. Uh, looks like it's about 12.3 bricks, uh, which translates to 1049 OG, which is actually one point only higher than our target. So that's awesome. So as you can see, uh, the Kvike ended up chewing through everything, and we're down to a final gravity of about 1.004. Uh, and also, uh, it dropped out like a rock. This beer is ultra clear. So looking forward to kegging it tonight and uh, get it on gas and carved up soon. All right, so fermentation was interesting. Um, either I have no idea how to use this yeast properly, or something is wrong with it. Uh, so I ended up pitching only a tablespoon, and that's what's recommended. Um, and it actually took 48 hours to kick off fermentation, uh, which is a long time, even for a standard liquid yeast. So even though it did hit its final gravity within a week, uh, I did notice that it had a serious amount of uh, acetaldehyde. Uh, I think I'm saying that properly, but that's that green apple flavor that you get from a, uh, a beer that basically was underpitched. So I'm guessing there's a lot of contradicting information out there, uh, but basically what happened was I ended up having a fermentation with stressed kvike yeast, um, despite having had a substantial amount of it, as you saw, that I put into the fermenter. This is going to be one of those times where I'm asking you guys for help. Uh, what happened? What did I screw up? I'm assuming many of you have more experience with the Kvike yeast than I do, uh, so I'd be very welcome to <laughs> whatever knowledge you have to pass on with that. Uh, last time I used it, I pitched a bunch, and you guys told me that I overpitched, so I just dropped out a tablespoon this time, and perhaps maybe the yeast was old, I don't know. 
Uh, it was kind of frustrating, to be honest. Um, but either way, the beer did finish really dry, as you saw, and it finished clean. Um, it doesn't taste bad. Most of that acetaldehyde has been cleaned up because I let it sit for another week and a half after I finished the fermentation, which supposedly you should not have to do with this yeast, um, unless I'm wrong about that. But uh, anyway, obviously I'm a little upset about some of the characteristics of the fermentation, but uh, the beer itself tastes pretty decent. So let's go ahead and get that going. Okay, so I ended up calling it Sunbeam. Uh, it comes in at about 5.9% ABV and uh, 22 IBUs. And yes, I'm pouring this very slowly because it's actually very heavily carbonated. Uh, so Pierce's Wise, this has got to be one of the palest beers that I have ever brewed. Um, as you can see, it is not clean. It's kind of got this haze in it. Um, and I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it absolutely refuses to drop out. So I'm just going to take it as it is right now. Uh, but the head on this thing is absolutely unbelievable. It is absolutely one of the rockiest, most robust uh, heads on a beer I've ever brewed. Uh, it is absolutely stark white. Very, very fine and compact, tight bubbles, um, and it sticks around for a while, and which is awesome, um, especially for force carbonating this beer. So I'm pretty happy with the way that that looks, uh, outside of the obvious lack of clarity. But having a nice, really pale beer is pretty awesome. Um, so now, a couple minutes after pouring, uh, the head has the the fluffiness of the head has gone away, but it's just still got some lacing on it, and uh, it's remaining on the surface for a while. Uh, bubbles are continuing to rise. I did characteristically carbonate this quite heavily um, as it is required by the style to be heavily carbonated. Um, so uh, I think it looks pretty good in the glass despite not being clean and clear. So I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, so we'll go in for aroma. So I'm getting a lot of corn on the aroma. Corn and sweet malt. A little tiny hint of fruitiness, um, kind of like a, a grapefruit, perhaps. And uh, going in for mouthfeel now. So very effervescent, very, very strongly carbonated, um, Saison-like, actually. And in terms of having a very dry beer in conjunction with a very highly carbonated beer, um, this thing does feel like a Saison in the mouth. It's like almost not there. It's extremely drinkable. Uh, there is very, very little uh, remaining flavor after you've swallowed. It's just extremely clean. Um, and it is not an intense flavor, so it doesn't really stick around for that long. Um, but the mouthfeel is incredibly light bodied. This is my first time using corn as an adjunct, and uh, I think people do say that it tends to create an extremely light body in the beer like that. Hence, it's, you know, used in American macro lagers all the time. Uh, so, makes sense. All right, now for the best part of the flavor. It's an extremely delicate beer. Um, so at first you kind of get some of the same corn barley notes uh, that you get, well, when you're drinking an American light lager. Um, there is a little bit of that kind of, I don't want to say cattiness, but well, there's a characteristic of when you are about to take a drink from a glass of Bud Light, uh, <laughs> there's a corniness to it. <laughs> that's, I think that's what I'm getting. Um, but at the same time, there's actually a really pleasant lemony kind of character, and I think that's coming from the Galena hops, and also possibly in conjunction with the yeast that I used. Uh, Hornindel Kvike is known to throw off a decent amount of free notes, and lemon is definitely among them. This thing is super refreshing, goes down super easy, uh, and there's not a ton of flavor there. So this is definitely one of those beers that's very approachable. If you're somebody who's used to drinking macro beer for most of their lives, then this is the type of uh, the beer that you might give somebody to bridge that gap. Uh, it definitely does not have a ton of flavor, um, but it's also definitely not like a watery piece of crap like most of those macro lagers are. Um, so you get like a corn character, you get a little bit of sweet malt in there as well, uh, but it seems like it's a perceived sweetness, uh, mainly because that finishing gravity was so low. Um, and then there's a, just a nice kind of pleasant hop presence. Um, it's not bitter, it's not uh, any sort of hop uh, character other than just having 
at least a little bit of a fruity note. I think having that extra little bit I threw in at the end uh, definitely made a contribution to the flavor in terms of bringing out that extra fruitiness. Was it necessary? Definitely not. Um, but it adds some character to the beer that I, I do like. Um, it's just, yeah, I wish this would clean itself up. So as far as the Kvike yeast lending itself to a clean character, I don't know how well that did. Um, this haze, I'm not sure what it's from. It's not chill haze. I haven't had chill haze in my beers in a very long time, ever since I started using that plate chiller. Uh, but it's, it's just got this kind of, it's incredibly fine haze. I mean, it could be yeast haze, but I hit it with gelatin. So gelatin typically will clean out yeast haze in a matter of hours. Um, it's not a hop polyphenol because I didn't dry hop this. And it's not, a, I don't think it's a protein haze because corn doesn't really have protein in it. Uh, it's a, mostly sugar. I'm not sure what it is, but if you guys know, let me know. Drop it in the comments section. Let me know. I'll read it. Um, I'm really curious and kind of frustrated. As far as getting down to the actual desired final gravity, Kvike uh, did an absolutely fantastic job. You know, 1.004, it's lower than I calculated I was going to actually hit. Uh, so that's great. I mean, it chewed through it well, it just took a while. Earlier there was kind of that Kvike character to the beer when it was younger. Uh, in conjunction with the amount of green apple flavor I was getting, I was not very optimistic, but give it enough time to age it, um, it kind of has taken a background note now. Um, you still get kind of a little bit of that melony lemongrass kind of uh, character that Kvike will lend uh, to a beer, but that's about the extent of it. And to be honest, like I can't tell if the lemon character is from the yeast or from the galena. I think it's from the galena. And it's not bad in this beer. It really isn't. It's extremely refreshing to have on a spring day like this. I mean, it's 65 degrees outside. I'm sitting on my porch. I'm enjoying this time. I would say it's not necessarily a lawnmower beer because it's 5.9%, but it sure feels like one. Um, but like I said earlier, definitely one that you can give to your macro lager love and friends and they'll love it. Um, and if you are one of those people that likes those macro lagers yourself, no shame to you whatsoever. This is a type of beer you can brew at home with ale yeast and not have to go through the extremely intensive process of creating something like a Budweiser. If you've ever actually looked into the Budweiser brewing process, it's extremely complicated and it's actually very advanced. So at the end of the day, I'm probably going to give this like a six and a half out of 10. Uh, just not my favorite beer style, you know, um, I don't really like the light flavored beers. I really I prefer my beer to be full of flavor. I'm also docking at points because it just is hazy. I don't want it to be hazy. It needs to be clear, clean, and bright, uh, and it's not. So I'm definitely upset about that. And I just wish it didn't have as much of that fruitiness. I think it had a little bit more of that corn flavor, that sweetness in the background, a little bit less of the fruitiness, it would be better. I'd say moving forward, maybe nix the 10 minute, maybe even the zero minute uh, hop additions and just stick with that single bittering addition up front. I definitely recommend taking every step you can to clarify it as a beer. I mean, it tastes and feels as clean as a normal lager uh, does, but it just doesn't look the part. And honestly, like in terms of beer, looking the part matters. So yeah, I'm going to be hard on this one. It's not my best, but uh, you know, it, it's still definitely a pleasant beer for the time of year. It's not going to stick around too long because uh, I've been drinking these quite a bit uh, at 6% and feeling like a 3%. It's, uh, it's not too bad. At the end of the day, it's all about your own individual taste anyway. Yeah, I'm obviously going to bash my own beers a little bit extra hard uh, just, to, <laughs> just to learn something from it, you know. Uh, but I definitely encourage you guys to go try this on your own if you can. If you like the video and you like uh, watching this type of thing on a regular basis, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Both of those things really do help me out a lot. Uh, it makes my channel a lot more visible to YouTube, and I appreciate it all. Um, I do read every single comment that I get, so if you want to drop something down there about uh, Kvike yeast or just the brew day in general, just anything talking about home brewing, I will gladly get back to you when I can. And if you want more frequent updates about what's going on in my brewing life, I have an Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer on Instagram. And there I tend to post every couple days about what's going on in the world of my brewing. And you'll see things which will probably make their way to the YouTube channel within a couple weeks on the Instagram. Uh, you'll just be updated in real time. And last but not least, in the description box down below, you'll see a complete recipe for this beer if you wish to brew it yourself the way I did. And you'll also see a compiled list of all the equipment that I use to brew beer with now, uh, along with some links to Amazon where you can purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Uh, just be advised that if you do click on one of those links and actually buy something, I earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. 
And it's a great way to uh, support this channel if you're interested in buying some brewing equipment. So anyway, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I'm gonna go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer and I will catch you in the next one. So cheers, guys.